Hey guys, introducing the Heart of the Life Coaching Program. If you're ready to transform your business, elevate your fitness, and deepen your personal relationships, including the one with yourself, our Heart of the Life Coaching Program might just be what you need. This is not a generic one-size-fits-all solution. It's a tailored coaching experience designed to help you achieve your unique goals. We're taking applications now. So if you're serious about making a change, DM me on Instagram at kellysiegel.71, the word coaching. To learn more, apply. Let's grow together and truly become harder than life. I'm Kelly Siegel, and this is Harder Than Life, a podcast about self-love, self-awareness, business, and health. We tell outrageous stories and boil everything down to simple, practical advice you can start using today. Let's get living. Welcome to the Harder Than Life podcast, where we delve deep into the strategies that forge success from the fires of challenge. I'm your host, Kelly Siegel, and today we're joined by three masters of the corporate arena, renowned CEO business coaches who specialize in transforming challenges into triumphs. They're here to share their unique insights and top strategies for leading effectively, making bold decisions and navigating the complex world of business leadership. Get ready to uncover the secrets that propel CEOs to the top of their game. Let's dive in. But first, let me introduce you, Christy Cool, Michelle Rios, and Rudy Ricksteins. Thanks for making the trip to this fabulous studio. For those of you that are not watching, I I suggest you head right over to YouTube and uh, see our our digs, man. We're in Dallas for for Amber Lee's event, and uh, you guys made a special trip, and I love it, and I appreciate you very much. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks for having us on. So today, uh, I, I just had to use this as an absolute freaking treat for everybody. So today, we're gonna we're gonna kind of use me as a blueprint. It, it, it's the playbook or uh, blueprint, so to speak, of becoming a CEO. And then once you become a CEO, how do you become a better, more successful, more impactful CEO, especially given these different times that we're in now? So we're gonna start it off with what. Do you consider the cornerstone of a successful CEO's daily routine? And I'm going to start right with you, Christy. Mm, Systems. Systems. Boom. Yeah. Personal systems for themselves as well as systems for the organization. Wow. That went freaking deep right off the bat. You know, I can tell you, harder than life, I make all the the wrong decisions. And this, I didn't have any system. I went, wung it. And it wasn't until I broke everything down. Mm-hmm. and yeah. implemented systems, and now we're doing more and more and more systems. That's how you scale. So that's mm-hmm. a great answer. Rudy, how about you? You know, I'm going to add to what Christy just said, because if you wake up every single day and you don't know who you are and where you're aspiring to get to, you're never going to get to where you want to go. And my estimates are that 98% of people live a life by default. They're reacting to situations and circumstances. And if you're going to wake up in the morning and not know what it is you want to have, be, do, and or achieve – then you're going to be living a life where you are reacting to situations and circumstances. So when you walk into your day, you're not planning your day. And so I'm going to really go back to how do you wake up? Who do you want to be? How do you want to show up in the world? And what are the systems you're utilizing to prepare you to be the best you? So systems, work on yourself. Michelle? I'm going to build on what Rudy just said and say, you need time and solitude. And this is a tough one for me because most CEOs spend a lot of time in solitude just based on the level that they're at and the work they do. But having time to really clear your mind, know what you're going to focus on in the course of that day, and know how to activate requires quiet time and just really getting to know what the course of the day is going to bring. And frankly, Letting everything that happened the day before go, which is a tough one. Live in day tight compartments, rest and recharge. Oh, where have you been all my life? I need, I thought go, 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 go was it. And and there, I have a pretty large following of 15 to 25 year olds. And, and, and I want you to listen to this question. You guys get your notepad. How can CEOs balance the pursuit of professional success with personal happiness? I've said a thousand times to each one of you guys, and I say this on the air with other happiness or money doesn't make you happy. Happiness will make you money. Mm-hmm. How do they balance that success? We'll start where or how do we balance that, Rudy? You know, I'm gonna speak straight into the question, but I wanna do it from the lens of who's listening. And you just said you have a large audience, which is young children who are in their twenties, you know, under their twenties, wanting to aspire to be CEOs or wanting to create an impact in their life. 
And I want to speak to the 15 year old version of me who would never sit down and talk about his feelings, who wasn't open to journaling or to meditation or to being mindful or to pouring into himself. He was doing everything that he thought would give him validation. He would do all the things that he thought everybody else wanted to do. And so I want to share something that I read recently. There was a survey or a study done with a hundred billionaires. And there was only one thing that every single one of them all did, self-made billionaires. There was only one thing. Now, there were many things that they did, but only one thing that every one of them did, and that was journal. Mm. And if you can think about the act or the practice of journaling, why am I feeling this way? Where am I wanting to go? What am I wanting to achieve? Who do I want to be? And writing out the answers, that is where you find the clarity in who it is that you want to be. And if I could have done that at 15 years old, man, I would have saved myself 20 years of pain and suffering and struggle and heartache and trying to do all the things to be successful when in reality at 15, I was already as successful as I ever wanted to be because I had the happiness potential in me, but I wasn't living to the potential because I was focusing on all the wrong things. Same question to to you, Christy. Yes, absolutely. We'll sort of build on the beautiful message that Rudy just mentioned. Self-awareness is everything. And the exercise that you started to walk them down, I think is one of the best exercises is, is uncovering what emotions you're feeling at the time. I think that's the easiest way to figure out uh, how you're feeling and, and to have the self-awareness. Taking that a step further, you know, one of the things that I see for people when I go into uh, the organizations is where are they spending their time? And are they spending their time on the activities that you talked about? So I think, again, speaking to the audience of 15 and 20 year olds, you're going to have to do things that you don't necessarily enjoy doing to get the ball across the finish line as you're building yourself and you're building your business. But once you get to that point and you are CEO, where are you delegating and how can you get 75% of your time to be spent on the areas that are your zone of genius? Because if you can stay of your zone of genius and delegate the things of, out of your zone of incompetence, your zone of competence, and even the zone of excellence, that's usually where people get stuck then the happiness that you feel that all the time and the day goes by and you have no idea that the whole day went by. You didn't eat all day because you're doing all the activities to Rudy's point that really make you happy and fulfilled. Journaling, needle moving, working on the things that matter. Michelle, we're back to you. Yeah. Bring it I mean, home. I think I'm going to make them very happy um, because there's two things that you need to do, in my opinion. And one is for everything that you can identify that brings you joy, you need to spend time doing it. The happiness factor is really once you identify what brings you joy in your life and you spend time doing more of that, that is going to equate to how happy you are in your life. And it is completely up to you. The second piece of that is for everything that you identify that brings you joy, you also need to identify the thing that you're going to be disciplined about. And I always say the balance between joy and discipline is really where the happy life resides. Because when you are taking care of yourself, you are eating right, you're getting enough sleep, you're journaling, writing down goals makes goals more attainable and achievable in a quicker amount of time. So I'm a very big fan of that. But you really do need to carve out what brings you joy. If you look at those people that are most successful in the world, they have hobbies. They are not only doing their work. They read voraciously. They're equestrians. They are part of a competitive sports. They do things. And that's an important part of building out your life. And I'll tell you right now, the old mantra of, well, it's work, so it doesn't have to be fun, is gone. You know, that's an old school way of thinking. If you're going to spend most of your life working, find something that you do enjoy doing, there still needs to be discipline. And I think that that's the balance between things that will keep you disciplined and healthy and clear-minded along with things that bring you joy and will move the needle for you. That's the what you need to be thinking about. The people that I watch and that I resonate to are the people that you can't tell if they're working or playing, but I, I'm going to one up what all you said. And I just put a post up about this the other day is I would tell people to work as much on their personal growth and personal development and personal improvement as they do on their job, mm. because I, I, it's just a loss, especially in this digital world we live in you're going to get when you achieve look at my social media when you achieve some sort of success they're they're gunning for you you got to be like one time my social media guy said are you okay and like why and he goes have you seen your comments it takes thick skin and and it's no matter how much work there's every once in a while that one gets through and hurts so twice as much work on your mind 
and your body as you do on your job. That's what I think. I'm going to come right back to you. Can you share, I know this answer and I just love that I'm coming to you. This Can you share a pivotal moment that transformed your approach to leadership? Oh, goodness. There's so many. Mm. And the reality is every decade brings a new one. But I will tell you this. I was, and I'm not going to share the one you think. Okay. Um, so I was a young mom juggling being married, uh, toddlers, and I was traveling the world. And I remember um, trying to pretend that I wasn't a mother when I was at work, that that part of me didn't exist Ooh. and that I was still as competent and strong a leader as anyone who didn't have kids because I felt like that's how I had to keep competitive. And finally, the CEO pulled me aside one day and said, female CEO, the next time you come in, bring your son. And I remember going, what? What are you talking about? She's like, he's an integral part of who you are. And because you're a mother, you bring a new nuance to your leadership style and what you do than previously. And we want all of you. We don't want just part of you. That changed everything for me because what I didn't realize is I wasn't showing up authentically. I was showing up with a mask every day saying, this is Michelle, the leader, the senior vice president that has all the numbers and these clients love her. And she's a CEO whisperer. And then I got to show up as my whole self. I'm a new mom and I'm some days struggling and my child just took my Blackberry and put it in the toilet because he knew it was time for me to be done. And it became just so much more joyous for me to not hide that part of me, to bring my full self into the work arena. And frankly, by doing that, I gave everybody else permission to do that. That's a great answer. I want to tell you something, deviate for just a second. I haven't seen you in person in a while, and there's a glow about you and an, a, a quiet confidence that I love. I, I Whatever you've been doing and eating and, and doing, keep doing it because <laughs> I just adore you. And I, ladies and gentlemen, she said the CEO whisper. That is exactly what she is. So listen to her when she speaks because big companies and big CEOs do. Same question to you, Christy. Can you repeat the question? Uh, can you pivotal moment that transform your approach to leadership? Hmm. I probably know where you're going to go with this too, but I want to. You do? I, I don't know. She threw that one. That one threw by <laughs> me. That was a good one. I, I like that one. Yeah. You know, the, the one that comes to mind with me, I was young in leadership and I was in a male nominated cutthroat medical device company and we had big numbers to hit. And somehow I was just able to figure it out when I was a, a sales rep. And, but as a manager, when I was taking the same approach, I realized that some people couldn't get it across the finish line. And I thought it was we hired the wrong people. I thought I had the wrong people on the team. But, but this is where, again, I, I talk a lot about systems. I was not coaching and develop, developing them the right way, and I was not showing them how to do things. Mm -hmm. So the most pivotal moment for me as I was rising young in leadership was the five-step coaching model and going, okay, you know, I know how to do this and everybody else knows how to do this, but why do I keep telling this person? I keep telling them, I keep telling them, I keep demonstrating over the phone, but why can't they do that? Why can't they have success? And so peeling that back and going, okay, well, I have to tell them, I have to show them, then I have to let them try, I have to observe, and I have to give feedback. That's really how you get duplication over time. And I, I let a couple people go, to be honest, because I thought I hired the wrong people. I stopped at the telling them, I didn't show them. Is it correct to say that you kind of looked at yourself and didn't, no more pointing one finger away, and you, you noticed the three yeah. that are pointing right? That's good yeah. stuff. Yeah. I'm going to switch one on you because I, this just came to me. Two women went back to back, female. I want to I want to say sexism, but but in effect, talking about back to back women, they both commented on how it's a little it's it's more of a challenge to be a woman. Do you see that when you're coaching in in the fortune in the big companies that you're coaching at? I do, but uh, it's slightly different because, you know, not all sexism is necessarily coming from the external. It's also coming from how we feel about ourselves. And what's interesting <sighs> is that there are so many women that are in the workplace, and I've got the statistics to share with you, that walk into work every day and they're really hoping that they're not going to get found out that they're a fraud or that they're a fake and that they're pretending to be something they're not qualified to be in the position. And they're holding CEO positions of really big organizations or they're senior vice presidents or presidents of companies. And, uh, and what's so crazy about that is is 
men walk in feeling exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the difference between the number is 8%. It's 8% more women. And so it's in the 90s for, for women and 80s for men. But we're all walking in feeling insecure, unsure of ourselves, not enough. And I want to bring this back for a second because you started the episode really talking about we need to pour into ourselves first. We need to work at ourselves twice as hard as we do at our job. And here's what the value is in what you're saying. And I want to make sure your audience is, is present to it is that we all have limiting beliefs. We all think and feel a certain way. And how we think and feel about ourselves is how we filter the information around us. And so if we think we're not good enough or not worthy, we're going to interpret every conversation from the lens of they think I'm unworthy, Mm. but you're actually feeling unworthy. And and it's going to literally change the 10 million bits of data your brain's going to see every second of every day. And then you're going to walk into a room and you're going to only find and focus in on the 50 bits of data every second out of 10 million that validates that you're not good enough and you're not worthy. But if you go into an organization like I do and support the leaders to start to realize that they actually are qualified to be who they are and what they're doing, it changes everything. And then they give permission to their people to be able to create the change. Here's what's really beautiful. And if there's anybody that's listening to this and you lead people, if you can build the self-worth in yourself and then you can turn around and demonstrate that to your people and teach your teams how can they show up feeling validated because everyone, like 91% of women are all showing up feeling like they're not good enough and 88% of men are walking in feeling exactly the same way. So that means that's in your team as well. Now, when you as a leader show up feeling validated and that you're good enough and that you're worthy and you give permission to your people to be able to do it, your business grows exponentially because people start questioning themselves. They start showing up authentically. They start bringing their children to work. I loved your story so much because, oh my gosh, I wish every leader would do that. I mean, if we only showed that one section of this podcast, it's going to change lives. It's beautiful. I'm going to reiterate what you just said perfectly because I'm going to show you guys how I felt both of those as a man, but didn't say, oh, it's because I'm a man. Um, I, I, when I would be a single dad with Ari, I would have to juggle and I would be embarrassed about it because one thing I failed at was marriage. So, but it wasn't until I started bringing Ari in and making her an integral part and actually family is a core value at National Technology mm-hmm. Management. So she knows everybody. She knows all of you guys too. Mm-hmm. She's talked to her. She's talked to you. She's going to talk to you soon. Um, so and then right now at NTM, we're breaking down uh, some sales uh, barriers. And you know what the problem was? Me. Mm. I was in the way. And I would say, why can't people just do it this way and do it? And, and it, so it really wasn't that a female or a male. It's we all do feel the same things. And it really, I loved, I just got finished with uh, Jamie Kern Lima's book, Worthy. Mm. If you guys have not read it, such right, a read good it. one. Can I just follow up on what somebody Please do. Said? I was waiting because for somebody to do that. The self worth piece is so incredibly important. So there was a point in my career, and I spent more than twenty five years in the uh, public relations and marketing agency arena, and working with corporate clients. And there came a time where I was a vice president. I was coming up through the ranks. I was working incredibly hard, and I stalled. And I got really frustrated because I was seeing other people get promoted and I was carrying massive global multi-million dollar accounts. And I knew that I was valued, but I was not getting moved up. And finally, they brought in a coach for me. And I was insulted at first because I was like, I don't need a coach. I know what I'm doing. I'm great at my job. People love me. And the coach Oh, he was great. He sat, he, we, we actually left the building, which is good. And he said, you work more than anybody else here. Number one, number two, even though you won't say it because you have a chip on your shoulder, you're probably the most insecure leader I've met. And I was like taken back. Cause I was like, no, but I project. He's like, your energy does not indicate that because I was thinking I wasn't good enough. They must, I must not be good enough because I'm not moving up. And my energy projected that. <laughs> When I stepped back and he said, what aren't you doing that you need to be doing for you? I wasn't drinking enough water. I wasn't getting Mm -hmm. enough sleep. I wasn't taking vacations. I wasn't spending time with friends. And he said, that's what you're going to do this week. And that's what you're going to do next week. And we spent months working together. In six months, I got moved up. The next year, I moved up again because I started actually investing in myself and my self-worth skyrocketed. It just completely changed the trajectory of my career. And I had been stalled at vice president for a significant amount of time. And it didn't need to be that way. How old were you during this time? 
I was in my early 30s. I just wanted to timestamp that for people that. But I mean, that went on for a good <laughs> chunk of my 30s, most of my 30s. Do you keep and in touch with that good coach by any chance? I, and we're still very good friends because he was, I've had three coaches that have sort of trans really um, changed the trajectory of my life. One many, many years ago in my 20s, who you know about, mm -hmm. and then this particular gentleman that was really integral in my rise. And mm -hmm. then I, I have a business coach now that I work with. Great transition. I and mean, this isn't even on here. So one of the things we should talk about is everybody should have a coach and mm -hmm. everything. So Christy, what what makes you you and why would I come to you for a business coach? And then also what should people be looking for in when they hire a business coach or, yeah. or and it's any anything any coach for that matter yeah. business life ceo yeah well i'll start with the second question first to answer i'll answer that one first but you know i think that you have to um first and foremost there's a lot of coaches out there and i'll <laughs> say that you know i led teams for 15 years in the medical device industry and i could have had any job in any company i had a, an incredible reputation and everybody kept saying when i was transitioning out i didn't know what i wanted to do but I went to a Tony Robbins event and I realized that if I stay on this path, I would never reach fulfillment because it was the only thing I had capacity to do was work this way. And it was planes, trains and automobiles and high stress and I was never home. And so everybody said you need to be a coach. And at that time, everybody became a coach. So everybody's getting these certifications and I had a stigma against it because it was like there was everybody that I met was a broke coach. Nobody had life experience. <laughs> nobody had business experience. And I, and I didn't want my reputation, you know, my when I grew up. Like I wanted the reputation that my dad had. He had great work. He had a great work ethic. He, people loved him. People loved his energy and his personality. And I, my name was everything to me. And I thought I do not want to be a broke coach and be coaching people on things that I don't know. So it took me at several years to really fall into this and put my stuff out on social media and embrace it. And now I, I, I know that I'm one of the best coaches out there. Um, first and foremost, I'm not going to do anything that I don't know. I'm not going to advise you on something that I don't know. A lot of us, we're all saying the same things to an extent. We're saying it in, diff in different ways. So I think first and foremost, you need to find a coach that has testimonials, real testimonials is what I'm getting at. So, you know, what's their credibility? What's the testimonials? What do they help people with? And can they help you? So do they have a path that can get you from where you are to where you're going? Because people do have specialized tracks too. So, that, so check that. Also check and see, like, do you resonate with their energy? Mm -hmm. Some people like, I can't even stand to listen to them talk on, on Instagram or, <laughs> you know, their voice hits me wrong, but we all have that. And it's like, you know what, this, I, this, their energy's off or there's something that's coming through here that I you just can't listen to what they're putting down. So do a check there as well. And then, um, uh, and then, you know, it's really, to me, it's down to a lot of the basic things too. So, you know, the accountability I used to write off. I used to think that everybody should be able to hold themselves accountable. I think that everybody should have a coach because you need systems, you need accountability, you need energy, and you should have some sort of community too. So whether you're getting that within your coaching program or outside, you should be around a group of people that all believe in this, that you should have coaches and mentors in, in your world. So the first question, what's, uh, what's your claim to fame? What, what, what will you move the needle at the fastest? Like if you, if it's a CEO or a business comes to you, how do you, what's your core your, your sweet spot, so to speak. I know their, ne their next step. I know exactly what they do for their next step. And, and, you know, most people are trying to see the finish line and that's where you get stuck is trying to figure out well, how am I supposed to get from here to here? And what are the 14 steps to get there? You need to take action. And I know what your next step is and that gets you action. And that, that gets me credibility. Very well, very well. Uh, Rudy, what, um, same question to you is, uh, what, what's, what should people be looking for in a coach and what's your sweet spot? You know, I don't think that there's a lot that we can add that hasn't already been added on the topic of looking for somebody that's done something. And I think what I want to do is is tell you a story. I think people learn best through stories. I was 25 years old. I was looking to invest uh, seven figures in investment portfolios. And my bank sent me three bankers to come and sit in my living room and show me different stocks and bonds and things that I wanted to put my money in. And they came over and we sat down and we had coffee and they spoke and spoke and spoke. And at the end, I had heard all that I had to say and I said, I have one question. And at the end, I was like, how much money do each of you have in what you put in front of me? 
and then there was a lot of humming and hawing and at the end of the day none of them had any money in anything that they were coming and I thanked them for their time and I did not invest with them. The reason I say that is because so many people are so quick to just bring somebody in because somebody's giving them a show. And, you know, you said something a moment ago about energy and I live in the world of energy. Mm -hmm. Your body already knows if something's, you know, meant for you or not. And Mm -hmm. if you are with somebody and it feels like, wow, you know what? My body feels very expansive right now. My body feels like it's very light and free. I'm excited. Then you should move forward with that person. If your body feels very restrictive, then you should run away because you already know what you should or shouldn't be doing and who you should or shouldn't be doing it with. And you can do that over a phone call, a Zoom call, in person. You can do that off a postcard and even off Instagram. We think it's the voice that's irking us, but it's the something behind the person that's doing it. And so we need to lean into that energy more. You asked a beautiful question. And what I do is hold people's highest and greatest potential. And if you ask me what a job title was, I would say I'm an expander. And so I go into either an individual's life or into the life of an entire organization and I expand every single part of the business and or the person. We want to achieve something. So you want to achieve health. You want to achieve wealth. You want to get married. You want to take your company from 100 million to a billion. Whatever it is that you're wanting to do, you have to be able to expand. But what people don't realize is there's fractional growth. And so if you are growing only the business, you're only growing the revenue, you're only growing this well, what about all the other sides of your business that aren't growing? What about all the other sides of your life that you aren't growing? And if you're only in the gym all day long, but you're not in your business, then it doesn't matter what you're doing because you're not going to have it for very long. If you're not pouring into your marriage, like every single area has to have a level of expansion. And so what I do is I go in and I elevate a person up onto a pedestal I hold them there. I give them the tools, the ability, and the belief that they can stay there until they are strong enough to stay there. And then once they've expanded, they become the example for their people and for their teams. We've gone into businesses with 3,000 people. We taught them to expand in their personal capacities. Then we've brought it into the business. Businesses in 12 months have grown from 400 million into the billion mark. We've taken 30,000 person companies and supported them to have the greatest revenue goals they've ever had in a 30 year 40 year history of the business and all we do is support people to expand in what they believe is possible in every single area of their life and that is truly to me the greatest gift is to see somebody living their the highest and the greatest potential i don't know where i saw this was something maybe it was on a car i don't know you talked about being an energy was it an energy coach or something i don't when i'm around you and i'm sure the ladies here can admit it, you just feel good so it must we must be in alignment I, I didn't say this, but I don't know why I never say this, but I hear it all the time. It's some coaches out there are making money being a coach, never, ever having done and made any money being a business, running a business. Mm. This is why I laugh. I'm in the room with full of greatness. And the only qualification I have is I run a business. I don't know the first thing about coaching, even though I'm going to start coaching. I think the reverse is true. I think you can make it, you do it. You could become a coach. It's like, uh, I'm, I'm a captain on a boat. So anytime anybody has a boat, they're like, well, Kelly knows how to do it. Just do it. No matter what the boat is, it could be a little rowboat. It could be a huge 80 foot yacht. And they're like, just let Kelly drive it. And you know what? I walk on with confidence no matter what it is. And I just go. So, uh, I guess that was just a, a disclaimer that look at your coach and make sure that they've actually done. You alluded to that where, so let me clarify, because, you know, I just supported a company to achieve a billion dollars and I'm not worth a billion dollars. And so if they came to me and said, well, we want to hire you to take our company from three, four hundred million to a billion dollars. Have you grown your net worth to a billion dollars? Well, the answer is no, I'm not pretending to be. What I'm saying is if you understand the practice and the principles and if you are actually doing the work, you can take it and duplicate it. You can take it and apply it into any area of life and achieve very, very similar results. And that's why you can go from your boat to boating and captaining any other boat because you understand the fundamental principles of how to be a captain. And that gut feeling that you're talking about, that that intuition is that incongruency Mm -hmm. of that person projecting. They know that they're full of it. So that's very interesting. Well, and I think to his point too about the energy and if you if you feel aligned to it or not, one of the things that I always say is you don't have to know the reason why. Like I, li- I like to say this to the young people too. Like you can unpack that stuff later. Like if it doesn't, if a young woman drives into a grocery store at 10 o'clock at night and a white van with no windows pulls up alongside of her, like is she going to get out of her car? <laughs> No, it doesn't feel right, right? And, and you know the reason why, but we still have like the same the same thing goes off in our body. So if you're with somebody or you're with a coach or a business partner or whatever it is that you're vetting out and you're like, I just can't put my finger on this, but something doesn't feel right, 
give yourself permission to walk away from that. Yeah. You can unpack it later, and it may take you years to figure out, you know, what your brain was rolodexing and your body giving you that signal to say this is not right. I just want to go one step further on the energy piece because this is really important. <laughs> I don't care how credentialed yeah. a coach may be when you're looking for somebody to work with. I do think you they need to have experience in the industry that you're in, either having worked themselves or being familiar with how it operates so that they can – advise, but the key work of a coach is not to be a consultant. It is to mm. ask the questions because we are trying to tap into the greatest, greatest and highest potential of the individual and pull it out of them, right? By asking these deep questions. One of the key things that I have found, the people who have hired me have not hired me because I had a degree, a MBA here and a degree from here and I'm credentialed from there. Although I am, it's because what are, what's, what's going on with you? That energy about you that just feels good. And I want to be aligned with that. That's been the greatest referral pipeline for me is investing in my own growth because that is what other people are looking for. And when we're talking about CEOs and leaders, these are some of the loneliest people you're going to find on the planet with the exception of you, because particularly big companies, because there are very few people that they can actually share what's happening with on a daily basis. So being in that space with them, holding the space for them to be a sounding board and often like a mirror and reflect for them is probably one of the most important jobs we have as coaches because most of them have all the answers. They don't know how to unpack them yet. And our job is to help excavate where some of these answers might come. It's not necessarily to say, hey, that acquisition that we are reading about in the paper, that might be a good thing for your company to do. Now, they might end up doing that based on the work we help them do. But a lot of the work is actually internal work, helping to get out of them the best of what they already have. I'm not even going to have to tell people to share this episode. This is masterclass. I am grateful for you guys to take the time out of this. I And, and I got to tell you that I, I wish, so you said holding space and I, you know, me and the personal development, holding space is huge because if you give me one thing through my whole life, I, I know the answers. I just need to clutter, declutter some of the things. So if you just said, how many times have I called you? And yeah. I, I asked you a question. And by the time I get the question out, I said, I already have the answer. I just had to hear myself and I needed to not be bothered. So holding space and having a sounding board is paramount in the coaching. I'm going to tell you, I made every freaking wrong decision, but somehow I ended up here. Uh, uh, and learn from other people's mistakes. Don't learn from your own mistakes. I mean, you learn from them too, but don't make as many because... There's other CEOs out there. There's other bosses. There's other entrepreneurs out there that have made these mistakes. They're not new. I've done it. I went out and partied like a rock star, making more money than I knew what to do with and thought I'd made it. I didn't make anything. So, which leads me to the next question. And I'm still going to give you your shot because I, I, I'm going to save <laughs> you for the last because yours is very special of how you, you've, you've come to where you are today. Um, Emotionally intelligent. Emotional intelligence is huge. They call it EQ nowadays. Um, how important is emotional intelligence in today's CEO leadership toolkit, Rudy? 75% of the human population is suffering chronic stress more than 75% of the time. And those are the latest numbers coming out of COVID. So what I want people to understand is they hear this 75% of every single person who walks out of their house for 75% of the day, which is every waking minute of every day that they're awake, they're in a heightened state of chronic stress. When you're in a heightened state of chronic stress, you have emotions that are being dumped into the body. Your brain's firing erratic thought impulses. Every time your brain has an erratic thought impulse, it produces another emotion. The emotion goes into the body. The body infiltrates every cell of the body. And you lose the ability to be logical. You lose reason. You lose inspiration, intuition. You lose creativity. You essentially lose yourself. You are walking around aimlessly reacting to life, and you are no longer in control of who you want to be, where you want to go. And all you need to do is wait 60 seconds because that's how long an emotion lasts inside the human body. So if you can hold your breath, take in a deep breath, hold your breath, look out the window, stare at a flower, talk to a friend, but just not be involved in whatever's causing the stress, the anxiety, the reaction in you, the stress will pass, the emotion will pass. 
the left and the right brain will fire again. You'll have logic and reason, inspiration, intuition, and then you'll be able to think through what it is that you're wanting to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm such an advocate for people understanding their emotional state, understanding their brain, because when you understand it, you take back your power, you take back your life. Emotional intelligence is not just a thing that is a cool thing that we should be doing right now. It is the single biggest driver in human behavior. Because right now you're being controlled by your emotions and you're having 50,000 thoughts a day and every one of those thoughts are being um, reacted to based on an emotional impulse that's going into the body and you don't know why you've been the way that you are. You don't know why you feel the way that you feel. You don't know why you keep doing the thing that you want to do and you want to stop doing and you just keep doing it and it's because you're not in control of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Respond versus react and and that's why I go back to the uh, work on yourself more because that reaction is usually some trauma, some trigger, something that has to be addressed with. How often are you, I'm just going to come to you. How often are you seeing emotionally, I want to say unstable, but how much do you see emotion being a challenge from a, from, from a boss ascension in, and to becoming a better boss? So look, I'm in the inner sanctum, so I hear it all, right? Like that they might not be necessarily expressing it, outwardly, but I'm the safe space. So I hear a lot of what's going on and what their concerns are, what their fears are. Um, I would say, look, a lot of the times, a, a lot of the work I end up doing is how much fun have you had this week? How can we lighten this? This is heavy. How can we lighten this? Because one of the things we get really caught up in is being the protagonist in our lives and what I really want our, you know, all of us, but leaders in particular to be able to do is step back and be the observer of their life and understand all of the things that are happening. Like we talked about um, some, unfortunately, sometimes business deals don't go well and the consequences are tough. But I always go back to the Winston Churchill quote, which is success is not final and failure is not fatal. Keep going, right? Usually out of these tumultuous times is when the rebuild happens. And this is a pattern not only in business, but it's in life. If you think about it, when something bad happens, tragedy strikes, or there's a loss, or there's a relationship that breaks up or what have you, it's this big valley. And then what? It's the build back up. It's like this in everything we go through. So if the leader can hang in and get through the emotional space that we need to hold for them, it might be 10 minutes to get through that, but be, you know, for me, they might just need to get it off their chest. And once it's off their chest, it's gone, it's released, but it's been bugging them for three days and we weren't talking until then. A lot of the time, it's just being able to talk to somebody about what they're feeling and giving them permission to say, so you feel that there's nothing wrong with feeling what you feel, feel the feeling, but now what are you going to do about it? Be the observer don't try to be the protagonist in every scene of your business and life. Sometimes we need to let some things pass before we act, before we make our move, and that's okay. There's a lot of I got to make a quick decision, people, in our worlds, and slowing them down a little bit is usually one of the most beneficial things we can do. Just slow down just a little bit. I've always said life is a roller coaster, and if, if it's not, it's flatline and we're dead. So, yeah, I, I, the ups and downs are everything. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deviate a little bit, Chrissy, for you, is when you walk into an entrepreneur, an owner, a boss, whoever you're going to coach, and you obviously see that this is an emotional issue. And, and, and you, if, in fact, inherently, if it's an emotional issue, it's not like to go, yep, you get, you pegged it. Mm. It's emotional. How, what is the tool or a routine that you're going to do with that person to try to get them emotionally regulated and or emotionally intelligent to be able to react and not respond. Yeah, I think to respond and not react. <laughs> Is that wrong? Sorry. Yeah, well, there's um it's 
I think it's bigger than just like a one answer. Cause I, I, you know, initially if, if they're heightened for a certain reason, you know, I think this is one of the number one reasons why a coach is so helpful. And the value that I provide is I, I don't have any emotion involved in your business. When I'm done with this coaching call and I love you and I respect you and I want the best for your business, but I don't have any emotions and history tied with these people. So I can see things as nothing but intelligence and logic. So So when they come to me and I can provide that sense of calm and I ask them, we're just question answers. We just allow them to find the answers within themselves and remove the emotion. So it's really, really um, important to ask the right questions that have nothing to do with emotion. Now, that's to diffuse a situation. So for me, you know, I have people that hire me, then I have people that pay extra to have on-call access when they have these issues. So if they're calling me to diffuse or it's their scheduled coaching call, you know, my goal is to ask them the right questions that bring them back to logic and decision based off of the outcome that we're looking for. Nothing about the person, nothing about what's going on at home with them, their history. Now, my goal is to is to help them arm themselves with the skills and resources to do this so you don't have to call me every time. And a big piece of that is boundaries. So you have to, you know, as you rise up to be CEO, what I find is, you know, my, my clients will hire me at 7 million, then they go to 14 million, then they go to 21 million. And now the organization just scaled at a, ve- you know, at a very rapid pace. But a lot of the people were the ones that you guys were working in the, you know, in the living room together, the Jamie Kern Lima stories where you're doing everything, the grit, the kids are there, the everything, and you're letting something slide and you're emotionally invested. But sometimes what got you there is not, isn't going to get you, you know, got you here, isn't going to get you there. And you have to make decisions and they have to grow and they have to come up with you as well. So, so at some point you have to put boundaries in place and protect your energy. So, you know, I, we can work on the things and what Rudy said about in the moment, I think is an absolutely beautiful exercise, uh, that everybody should be able to have in their back pocket to go to, but let's unwind all of that and go, okay, well, like how much sleep are you getting at night? What are you eating every single day? Are you nourishing your body? Are you having the fun? Are you, are you able to get the rest? You know, when you come into a meeting, do you know how to run a meeting? Are you telling people what to do? Is there any accountability? I mean, there's so many ways to do this so that again, when you are out in your business, you're it's business. It's not the emotion. And you know, you pop back in, it's a lo- CEO is a lonely place. A business owner is a lonely place because a lot of these people are your friends, but you can't do that. All the, you can't do that and run the company at the same time. Your brilliance and genius just radiates. I, I, I could just Thank sit you. here and listen to you for <laughs> hours because it's a masterclass. I will tell you what got you here will keep you there. Yeah. So if you're going to the next level, different levels require different levels. I was driving over with, with Michelle and I'm like, I am becoming a whole different person because we're trying to go into that eight and yeah. nine figures. And it's, I have, it's requiring a total different person. And yeah. I will tell you, go back to what he said. It is lonely. There's a lot of times I, 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 I'm, I journal. You, you said it and I, I meant to say it earlier. Journaling allows me to get the things off my chest that are just important to me. Mm. and nothing else so and you guys get pieces of it because i got access to all you i'm lucky i'm grateful for that but um that was that was great uh i want to we're going to go back into um how it's funny how i I was going i'm sorry my brains are going all a mile a minute what i was thinking is how freaking funny is it that that life business and and relationships and even romantic they're so alike standards Mm-hmm. boundaries, accountability, emotional intelligence. These are all things that we can use interchangeably, whether it be in a personal relationship, a romantic relationship, a business relationship. It's just a relationship. And then even your self relationship. Just find it. Keep coming back. The more you're the, you're your best investment and spend a, a way on it. So how one of the biggest things about me is being accountable. So how does it, should a CEO or an entrepreneur evaluate their own performance and health of the business effectively? I guess I should start with Rudy because the ladies have been talking so much. I love it. They're brilliant, (laughs) isn't it? Don't you feel like, I feel like the dumbest person here. I usually am. But the one thing I don't lack is I got the gusto and I follow through with what I'm going to say. But you're the prettiest person here. (laughs) I wish, I wish I'm, I got a, yeah, I got, I got a view of you on the side of my, I'm, luck, I'm the luckiest guy here by far. So thank you again, back to you. 
I, uh, I'm going to take that opportunity to say thank you for having me in this room because there's obviously incredible genius sitting uh, at each corner of the table. Um, you know, you asked a question. Um, I want really people to think about the value of of really what all we're saying here and how we get to show up each and every single day. And the higher up you go as a leader, the smaller your circle becomes and the less people you have to talk to and the more you feel like you can't be wrong and you have to be right and you have to charge forward. And none of that is true. And we know that that's the case because that's why all of these different platforms like YPO exist because that's a place for people to go and say, man, I don't know what the heck I'm doing and I'm failing here or I lost this, my marriage is falling apart and there's somebody to listen to and support you. But there's tremendous value in turning around and asking the people above you, below you and alongside of you, man, how am I doing? You know, my wife and I have a practice that we do every single Sunday. We got this from a book and we read so often, I don't even remember the book, but Every Sunday, I walk into the kitchen or the living room or outside and I'll say to my wife, how can I be a better husband? Like one to 10, like where am I and what do I need to do to be better? And then she'll ask me the same question and not directly after I've asked her the question and she'll ask, and it's typically a Sunday, you know, what did I do this week? Where did I, where did I drop the ball? Where did I lose? And sometimes I'll be like, you know, you traveled a lot this week. I didn't hear from you as much. You know, I know you were busy, but I kind of missed you. And then she's like, got it. So you just want a little more time. And it's having those conversations where you don't allow the resentment to grow and to build over time, mm-hmm. or you don't allow somebody to create a story around a scene or a situation over an extended period of time. But you know what? That also works in business. And in business, I go to my team all the time and I say to them like, man, how am I doing? Like, 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 how can I be better? Sometimes it's saying like, hey, could you give me some more space? Or hey, could you support me here more? Or could you pay more attention to this thing that I'm doing? Or, hey, you were really abrasive yesterday. Did you mean that? And creating, and you used a word earlier that I want to point out, uh, Kelly, and that was create a safe space. We all have to create safe spaces. Every single place we go is create a safe space for people. But if you're the leader and you think that you need to know everything, man, you you are not the smartest person in the room then. Because if you walk into the room and you say, hey, I am bringing the smartest people in and I want to learn and grow and I have value and brilliance. But in addition to that, I'm also open to feedback. And if we take the feedback and then apply that feedback, that's where we get the growth and everybody else gets the benefit from it. But I want to anchor something because we're talking about business. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about CEOs. We're talking about people that are 15 to 20 aspiring to grow. We're talking about people already growing in life. Man, none of this means anything if we're not learning and growing and if we're not taking what we're learning and growing every single day and applying it to our lives and becoming better because we go to work for a paycheck. I totally get that. But in reality, we go to work to create an impact and we go home to create an impact and we go to the grocery store to create an impact. And every moment of every day, even the person I sat next to on my flight this morning, every moment is a divinely orchestrated moment that is preparing us for the person we get to become. And sometimes it's in being the better person. Sometimes it's saying, man, I don't know, or I'm wrong, or I'm right, or how can I do this better? Or, hey, I've got feedback or experience of you. And in every one of those moments that we call hard moments or hard conversations or conflict situations are just beautiful opportunities for healing and growth. And I'm going to implore every single person. I don't care if you are you know, the butler or whether you were the CEO or whether you're the bellman or the doorman, your responsibility is to lead. And if you lead with the highest and the greatest potential of who you can be, you're teaching everybody around you to lead. And that's the only way to rise all ships. I, I microphone dropped that. I wanted to say <laughs> you're just beautiful. I, I am amongst, I just, I love this. This is great. Thank you again. I wanted to highlight something you just said, how, how we get to show up. Most people mm-hmm. wake up in the morning and they're like, oh, I got to go to work. I have to. We get to, man. We get Every to. single day above ground is a good day. Mm-hmm. There's people, what do they say? You think you're having a bad day? Imagine not having a day. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, you said another thing. and I don't have, I would be the first person to tell you, I don't have all the answers. I never have any answers. But what I am fearless about doing is taking the next step. I just know I'm going to make one more step. And at some point, we'll have to make a decision. And we just have to make that decision. I don't have to make a decision that's the final decision. Just got to make the next decision. So it's just take that next step. So that was that was beautiful. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to go to you. Okay. Again, how, how do CEOs and entrepreneurs measure their own per- performance effectively? 
I mean, look, one of the first things we need to do is put things down in writing because I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations in hallways about plans and ideas and the goalposts are completely moving all the time. And that's not fair to teams. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to the people you work with. And the other piece of it is, um, and so going back and saying, look, where have things changed? And let's be honest, is this still the goal or not? Because it's really hard to evaluate progress if we have a completely changing goalpost week to week or month to month. And that happens, particularly with, I think, businesses that are re- like startups. Ha- this happens a lot. This happens with solopreneurs that then all of a sudden have a team of eight and 10 and then 20. I, one of the things that you know I, I often say is, are you asking people what they need? Because as the CEO or as the leader, we have to stop thinking like we're the smartest person in the room. And hopefully you're hiring people that will challenge you, that will bring counsel to you. But also, are you investing in mentoring? Because your role is to be the chief cheerleader of the people that you're working with. And I think that's often an the mistake of thinking, well, I started the company or I had the first idea. And so I always have to be the one championing innovation. And I always have to be the one with the next best idea. Not necessarily. Hopefully as you grow, the teams will feel empowered to be bringing ideas and growing with you. This is much easier in a bigger company, right? But, you know, I work with a lot of mid-sized companies and this is a huge growth Sometimes like there's a, a, the point of uh, hitting the wall where the CEO is like, I just don't know what to do. Like, they're not listening to me. We're not going in the same direction. And partly is it, you, what you have to step back and say, am I willing to be the chief mentor officer? Am I willing to be the cheerleader of these people and see how I'm bringing the best out of them? Because often they're going to bring ideas that you didn't even have. Because again, they're coming at this from a different perspective. And oftentimes measuring success should be, if I'm the CEO, how is my team doing? How is my team operating? How are they feeling about being in this place? How are clients feel about being under our advisement or working with us? That brings up such a different point as being being an owner of a company. I I literally... I've learned that (laughs) I use the Caddyshack line, the world needs ditch diggers too. Mm -hmm. And that's not, I always thought that that was a knock, but certain people don't want to Mm -hmm. grow and they're fine. I have a gentleman that's worked for me for 25 years and and he grows every year, but he doesn't want to move out of his position. He's going to retire at NTM and and that's okay. I used to think that was crazy. What do you mean you don't want to come be the boss? So I'm learning, but I, I want to remind all the listeners that, that we're talking about big business, but listen, national technology management is a small and medium sized business. So you guys work with everybody who's looking to grow and, and make an impact. This, you said solopreneur, it's anybody. I don't care if you're running a small business out of your house and, and, and I don't care if you're just starting a paper route. I mean, these systems and processes and routines and habits and rituals, everything we're talking about works for no matter what you're doing, which is, I'm going to save that last, this question for you last, because I'm sure you're going to go, everybody starts off when they're starting their company and I need letterhead. I need, I need to have my website up. I need others. What systems do you see in place that, that, that a CEO or a solopreneur or business owner would need to put into place that is a vital so they can measure are the, am I doing well? Because everybody thinks, oh, I had a great business meeting. Nobody ever looks at a meeting and go, man, I bombed. Well, I do. Actually, I bombed that one. Wow, I put my foot in my mouth. And I used to write it down. And I would say, what did I do? What did I say up? I'm, I'm aberration. What if you're going, walking in system because you're a system person and I love that. Mm-hmm. I need more systems. Mm-hmm. What system would you put in place? Would you recommend somebody put in place to hold themselves accountable and measure true growth as a CEO or an owner or a business? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think that, um, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of smart goals and setting the smart goal. So, you know, I, th- wait, wait, wait. Tell people what smart goals like a, are. Yeah, so it's a specific, measurable, attainable, real-time, timely goal, realistic and timely goal. And so instead of just saying, like, well, we're going to grow our sales this year, it's like, well, we're going to grow our sales by $14 million by July you know, 30th. So and specific, so, measurable, measurable yep, attainable, attainable yep, realistic, realistic, 
and time. Time sensitive. Time sensitive. So, so you put a time frame. Yeah, We're going to do it this year. Yeah, put a time frame, yeah. Love it. But here's the thing that a lot of people like, like, and for your business, I know you want to grow. Like, so now we reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. right? So all the way down to the day. So how many sales calls do we need to make? How many conversations? How many lunches of happy clients do I need to do this week to look for referrals if that's a way? So how are you getting your business now? Can we just do more of that? So I, I'm a big fan of smart goals and then rolling it back. So now every day when I go in, I'm like, okay, this is exactly what I need to do. And if I need to make sales call, I'm going to move that paper clip over. There's one. Okay, there's two. Okay, there's three. If you put in the throughput, you're going to get the results. It, it, it just, it's just the way that it goes. Now, when life gets busy and when you're a solopreneur and you're doing all these things, sometimes, you know, these uh, things come at you. And this is where boundaries need to be in place and you need to have a plan every day. Stacking wins is incredibly important to, for confidence. And you need to look for little wins every day. And so if it, when life goes crazy and you can't get to your, you know, your list of things you need to do, what's the most important thing Kelly needs to do today? to move the needle forward. So if, if life gets crazy and when you hit your bed, your, 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 your head hits the pillow, what's the most important thing that I need to do today? Now I start off all of my companies, uh, with a format of going into a huddle every morning. So if you brought your leaders together and said, okay, well, what's the most important thing you need to get done today, Kelly? Right. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Now what could potentially get in your way? Now you're thinking differently about that. What, what could potentially get in my way of getting this most important thing done? So that's an easy way to go, okay, let me clear all the smoke. Let me clear all the stuff as a CEO. Everybody's coming to me with problems, and I'm the answer and whatever. One thing, and if you do that every day, think about you know, then how far you move the needle within, within a five-day time period. That's, that's pretty big. What you just said is the single most important thing thing of business that isn't emotionally it, it's completely in our everything's in our control but what i that's besides emotional intelligence besides working on yourself that's the number one thing specific measurable attainable real time or real and then time to, timely yeah every question whether what you have to do if you go back and ask against those will tell you should you be doing it should you not that i want mm -hmm. you guys to go if you're thinking about starting a business or you're stuck go back and ask the question do you have smart goals? Well, and you just brought up a point that I don't think I covered that I want to um, I want to make sure people hit is like, you know, and this is personal and professional too. everything you do, because again, life happens and it's coming at us 100 miles an hour and we got to get groceries and we forgot to get this and we're running over here. Is this thing and when you write out your to do list, is this getting me closer to my goals? So Michelle's big about goals. Me too. Write them out. Mm -hmm. Now, is this thing getting me closer to my goals? Now, sometimes you have to do it anyway. You have to cook food. Yeah, it's getting you closer to your goal. You got to eat. You want your body to look a certain way. But so it may not be a thing. So some things you're like, no, it's not getting me closer to my goal. I got to take girls night off on Friday or I got whatever it may be. But if you have to do it and it's not like, a you know, right in line with a goal, can I do this faster? Can I outsource this? Can I get my groceries delivered? Like, you know, because time is our most precious resource. So always ask yourself, what am I doing right now? And is it getting me closer to my goal? So I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little more harsh. I, you can we can all be busy doing nothing. Yeah. I, you, sir, I I went down a rabbit hole watching coaching videos. Sure. Do I need to watch those? Yes. But is that really moving my? Is that specific measurable? Attempt? It's not. I need training. I need to learn. But at that very moment yesterday, I actually needed to record content. <laughs> and I I didn't get my last record video recorded until like seven o'clock last night. And then I left a half of it done. So again, is this moving the needle? I used to even say, is this putting money in my pocket? Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Because so the high paying activities as a CEO is what you should be doing. Oh, we can be busy. Oh yeah. man. I, I could send a thousand emails that say nothing. All right. We're going to move into my favorite topic, vulnerability. How does vulnerability fit into a successful company? And I'm going to start with you, Rudy, because you're the feelings master. <laughs> <laughs> Every single person on the planet wants one thing. And we think that we want a big house and a trophy husband or wife, or we want a yacht or a retirement fund, or I don't know, a helicopter in our chalet in Hawaii. But the only thing we really want at the core, every single human is connection. Every single person on the planet wakes up every single day, goes to bed every single night, and the only thing that we really want is meaningful connection. And the only way to create a connection is through vulnerability. And so many people, especially leaders, they remove the vulnerability because they go to work and pretend to be a version of something that they're not, and they leave the vulnerability 
at home. What I love about you, Kelly, is that you're the first person to poke fun at yourself, which we're going to we're gonna shift that slightly. But you're the first person to poke at yourself and say, oh, you know, oh, I've made all the mistakes or, oh, you know what, I can goof and I can do that. And, and that is actually in itself vulnerability. And that is a strength. Mm-hmm. And when you can show up and be okay and be clumsy and point a finger at yourself and not have to pretend to be something that you're not, people are connecting with you and people see themselves in you. And then so people like you. And so if they like you, they're actually liking themselves because life is really just a mirror. And every single person and every experience is just mirroring back to you who you are and how you see yourself. And so the more you are vulnerable and the more connection that you create, the more you allow people to see themselves through you. And so the more people are going to know you, like you and love you. And I'm going to tell you now, I never go to bed at night counting dollars. I never go to bed at night thinking about where I'm speaking and what I'm doing next. I, I reflect back on the people I touched that day. I'm always present in that moment, in that day. And the things that really stand out to me are the conversations I had with people, the moments where somebody cried, somebody got a hug, somebody said thank you, somebody had an honest conversation with me, whatever it is. And it's those moments where we have these interactions as human beings, where we connect as human beings, and we put the facade of the business or the money or the title or the talent down, and we're just human beings. Because at the end of the day, man, that's the only thing that's going to give you the greatest levels of joy, fulfillment, and freedom, and that is creating an impact and the only way to do that is to be who you really are, and that's through vulnerability. So hold on a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come right back at you because you have an 8- and a 10-year-old, and I was flying here today knowing that I get to see people that I love and I think are just outstanding humans, and thank you guys again for coming. And I was thinking about, in my book, I wrote uh, that when I was 9 years old, my, my mother uh, almost killed me. And uh, I, can, I pictured when I was getting on the plane this morning her punching me in the face. And I'm not saying this for, for the, I'm, I'm going to get to a story. But she was punching me in the face. And the entire time that boy was saying, why? Why don't you love me, Mom? And I just figured if I did this, if I became this big businessman and this person that you got, that everybody would love and respect, she'd love me. And I drank that freaking poison for years. Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't until very recently that I released that. You know, it, it, we can go off on tangents like, it, and you know how I finally did it is if you could you imagine ever hitting your child and to the point where I almost died. And then I, just, I said, just played a little game and said, you know what? She was doing the best she could with what she had. Mm-hmm. She was drunk. She was an alcoholic. It was a problem. But I say that to come to you and ask you to be vulnerable and say, what is your biggest fear? What is your, what is the one thing that keeps you up or that you think about when that you put in your journal? And mm-hmm. I'm looking at Christy, sorry. That I'm not going to step into my full potential. Mm, that's good. Yeah. And how do you combat that? Take an action. And boy, do you take action. Yeah, take an you action. You were going to say something, Michelle, and I cut you off. I apologize. I just wanted to come back with this. With, with, no, with, no, uh, this is a beautiful share. So I don't want to um, come off this, but I was just going to say to Rudy's point, I think not only do we need connection, but people want to be understood. And I think the more they have that permission to be vulnerable and to be their authentic selves, the more likely those helicopters and yachts and other things are can be. So I don't want to like dismiss this for any of the 15 to 24 year olds that are thinking, but I might want those things. Then be your most authentic self. Be yourself. The more you show up as yourself, the more you're likely to attract what you want into your life. Maybe it'll be those things. Maybe it won't. But to be understood by by your fellow human is probably one of the best things and feelings in the world, isn't it? When you get the helicopter after you've done that, the helicopter will feel good. It'll feel good. But you can't get the helicopter first and think that's going to fill the void. It doesn't. But that's what I think is the most beautiful part, really, when you look at some social media are the people that are actually showing you what it really looks like, right? Not the filters, like the people that are showing you what does the day to day really look like. I feel like for me, I struggled for so long trying to figure out what does it really look like because of the industries that I was in, nobody would tell you, right? Everybody's lying to each other. Everybody's pretending like they're on their boats. They're not working 80 hours a week. But the people, and I, and that's why I'm so drawn to the three of you, is you tell the real raw stories of this work, this didn't work, this is, I'm, I'm so tired today, this is what is keeping me up at night, this is what I worried about last night, because that, that's real life, right? And, and there's nobody that's immune from that. 
Yeah, I, I, there's so much to that. I mean, we can go another hour easily on, on vulnerability. I, I think it's the coolest thing in the world. And when I started being vulnerable and, and letting my wall down and letting people see, you know, my fears, yeah, yeah, I'm a big guy, but I'm, I'm scared. There's mm-hmm. times I'm scared. Now, I would tell you that if I'm scared, it, it, that that's when I do my best work. And mm-hmm. it, but if I run, you guys all better run because we're, <laughs> we're in a bad situation. But um, thank you for 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 both of that. And uh, I want to come back to you and ask you to say, what is the what is the one fear or limiting belief holding you back? Ooh, limiting belief. I was going to say the one fear Chrissy and I share is that I won't have used my gifts to my full potential and that I will not have really 100% come into my fullest. Um, That's probably my biggest fear, that I've been given gifts and I didn't have the courage to fully step into them, that somehow I felt like I was an imposter or not good enough or not worthy enough to follow my dreams. The limiting belief, I think, you know, this is one that we all have and it happens from time to time. I had this earlier in the week with writing my book where I was struggling with a section and um, I was talking with a writing coach and I said, I don't see what happens next in this And it brought in a flood of concern of like, can I do this? Can I do this thing that I'm set out to do? And she said, you know, Michelle, when we talked first about this, it was going to be hard. And somehow now you think it shouldn't be hard, (laughs) but it is hard. And you will keep going and you are pioneering something different. This is kind of a different type of book. And she said, "Um, so the fear of not being worthy for it when no one else has really done it shouldn't be really a fear. So I would say my biggest limiting belief is that I'm not worthy of some of the goals and the dreams that I have. And I know that's a common one. Remember, they say hard times make hard people. Hard people make easy times. Easy times make hard times. Or easy people make hard times. So Mm -hmm. it's it's a circle. And if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. And that's why I call this harder than life. And really, when you get on that hamster wheel of good times, it becomes easy. Like, so I, my next book quite might need to be called easier than life. <laughs> I, I, I just, there's just no other way than to just keep going forward. And, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a of a vulnerability that I have, I, I, I because I wanted to share more, even more, but I, I just can't thank you guys enough for coming here, but I'm going to go around the, the tables and I want to get just final thoughts. Again, this is, a, this is a masterclass of business. And I want to remind everybody for the listeners, we all didn't know each other a year ago. And now here we are in Dallas all together from a quick phone call and we're shooting podcasts and we have a group text. And if anybody needs anything, and I just want to remind, this is the, this is the camaraderie we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. Rudy needs something. I'm there in a second. Any one of you guys need, we're all there. Hey, I got this issue. We're all willing to support. So this is the cultivation of this, this tribe, so to speak, that we have now. And we're all, I've seen growth in, in you two that is phenomenal. And I'm, I'm really happy to be there with you. And I, I want to tell a conversation that Rudy and I had yesterday was, I got to tell you, I've been wanting all these, I've been focused a lot on the outcome. And I realized I'm too focused on the outcome. I'm really loving who I'm becoming. Yeah. And it is, it is the feeling every day of becoming somebody new, doing new things that is way more cool to me than even, you know, and you guys know my goal is to donate a million dollars a year for the rest of my life. I think the feeling of, of getting on this plane and coming and seeing you and what we're about to do is way cooler than even the feeling once I actually do it, because that's going to fade quick. Mm-hmm. So anything you guys ever need, you know, you got, I got your back and I'm a good friend to have. So um, Christy, final thoughts for you. Final thoughts on leadership, just, on Life. Whatever um, you want to riff on, just just anything that we've talked about that you didn't get a chance. Yeah. We've only got an hour, so it's we you didn't know, really all get to go. When um when people are going to college now, I want I don't have any regrets in life, but I tell them to make as many relationships as they possibly can. It took me a little longer in life to realize that the quality of your relationships is the quality is directly proportional to the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit of vulnerability that we shared here, the camaraderie that we share here, being able to know that you guys are there. And then we all have an extension of all these other people in our lives as well. 
it really truly is what life is all about. It's the people that are in your life and the relationships. And if you take that a step further, you know, your business is all about the people that you know, too. And the quality of your business is comes back to the quality of your relationships. So I would just like to encourage everybody to go, okay, can I put, going back to systems, you know, who can I reach out to one a day? Who's one person that I could send a nice text to that maybe is already in my circle that I can just let them know? Like, hey, Michelle, I was thinking about you. So proud of what you're doing. Can't, re- can't wait to read the book. That, maybe that lands on a day when she needed to hear it and she's going, man, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Or this is hard. Yeah, so, I like that on the weekend. On the weekend? Okay. On the, <laughs> I'll do that. Weekend. I will do that every <laughs> single weekend. But really, like, you, you really don't... Um, we need to do that. And we also need to go, okay, are there any relationships that I need to go back and rekindle in my life? And then also where are there new relationships? Because, you know, our life just needs to continue to expand as Rudy says, mm. you know, you need to expand individually. So what if every single day you said, okay, who's one new connection I'm going to make? I'm going to reach out and look for a referral or, you know, whatever it may be. Can you make one new thoughtful connection online? Network is your net worth. We've all heard that before. And I got to tell you that we've all, all fed into each other. And I just tell you, just be genuine and authentic. Be yourself and people, the right people will gravitate to you. And and that's, there's no secret of how we all ended up here. And, and I'll just, I just feel the love from you guys so much. And I just keep giving love and giving love and I get it back. So I'm, I'm lucky, but uh, yeah, network is your net worth. And it's, what is it? What do they always say? It's not what you know, it's who you know. So yeah. Really great, is. great advice. Yeah. Michelle? You know, first of all, that was beautiful. So thank you for sharing that, Christy. Um, and and I really fully and wholeheartedly believe in the importance of relationships. I'm gonna add something we haven't really talked about. Um, we all, and I'm thinking about your audience, particularly the younger folks. We're going to get, you're going to get bombarded with a lot of points of view of what you should do with your life and what you should study and what you should become and where you should live and all of those things. And I'm going to encourage you to get quiet and listen to that quiet, faint whisper of your soul. It's your intuition. It is the most wise part of you. You carry all the wisdom in you already listen to the whispers that tell you what you truly want. That is what's going to drive you to become your best version of yourself. If you have the courage to listen. (laughs) You're beautiful. Rudy, bring us home, my brother. There are uh, only two reasons people ever achieve what it is that they really want in life, uh, whether they do or whether they don't. And that is, they either don't believe that what they really want to have is possible or they believe that it's possible, but they just don't believe that it's possible for them. And so I'm speaking to everyone that hears this and grounding in the fact that because you're hearing this message today means there's value and meaning in anything that you've heard here today and that you have to be present to that moment. And I hope that this is going to be received beautifully because you have a dream or a goal or desire to have it to be able to do something and that is on your heart and you wake up every day and whether you acknowledge it or not that presence is there and it's growing and you either don't have it right now because you don't believe that that thing that you want is possible meaning nobody can do it or you just don't believe it's possible for you and we have all today everybody has shared different vantage points of tools tips tricks hacks things that we can add implement into our lives and a handful of people are going to take some of this information and do something with it. And a majority of people are going to just listen to it and say that was great and not do anything with it. And what I want you to hear more than anything in the world is that you're worthy of everything that you want. Mm. That thing that is on your heart, man, it is not for you. It's that when you do it, you turn around and you share it with the rest of the world and you teach what you know. And, you know, your life is so, so, so powerful and so invaluable. And the dreams and the goals that you have, they're meant to come out and in the world but they can only come out if you put in the work. And everything we spoke about today was the work. And if you don't put in the work, you don't get to reap the reward. And the only way to reap the reward is to put in the work. And the only way you're gonna put in the work is if you believe you're gonna get the outcome. And you're gonna get the outcome because you're worth it. And I love you, I freaking love you, no matter where you are, no matter what part of life you're in, you and your dreams, you're worth it. Just do the work. You are here for a reason and you matter. And you're important. I'm going to remind everybody to become a sponge, become a learn it all like me. Uh, today's you have a you have masterclass. You can watch YouTube. You can you can have mentors that people would pay millions of dollars for. 
And I'm going to leave it with a Ram Dass quote that I love very much, which is uh, love everybody, tell the truth. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. I love you yeah. all. Love Thank, you Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Love you. Please rate and share this podcast. I'm active on all social platforms and love to hear from my Siegel supporters. Each and every episode is sponsored by my company, National Technology Management, the easiest and best IT company to do business with, delivering peace of mind with technology every day, even simplifying cybersecurity. Visit trustntm.com for more info. Until next week. Be harder than life.